Today is July 3rd, 2020. My name is Dana Yarek, and I'm interviewing Jose Flores for the Latino Oral History Project, Voces of a Pandemic Project at the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center, the University of Texas at Austin. Please know Mr. Flores that this interview will be placed in the Northern Illinois University Libraries and shared with the BOSIS Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you do want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree, after each one. There are several questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. The Center for Latino and Latin American Studies wishes to archive your interview, along with any other photographs or other documentation you might be able to provide at the Northern Illinois University Libraries. Northern Illinois University Libraries will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. So first question, do you give the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Northern Illinois University Libraries? Yes, I agree. Do you grant Northern Illinois University Libraries right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow Northern Illinois University Libraries to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to share your interview and your materials with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voces of a Pandemic Oral History Mini Project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? Yes, I agree. We have many questions in a pre-interview form that we have already filled out together. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Bose server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before Bose sends it to the Benson Library and NIU libraries, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library and NIU libraries. So do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview and your public file available to researchers at the Benson and NIU libraries? Yes, I agree. Finally, on occasion, the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies and BOSES receive a request from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Okay. So we got that out of the way. Let's get into this. Tell, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Who is Jose Flores? Okay, so, um, uh, so I'm Jose Flores. Uh, I'm a first generation here. Uh, my parents immigrated to the US, uh, brought me here when I was an infant. Uh, so <clears throat> ever since then, I've just lived a normal life. I would consider myself American because I grew up here. Um, all my experiences have been American, beside, with the exception that my household is a Mexican household. Um, so I kind of have that bicultural upbringing. Um, but yeah, today I am completed high school here, middle school, elementary school. I'm now in college and I am pursuing a medical journey. So I'm hoping to go to medical school one day. Uh, currently, I'm working as a CNA. So I am already in the healthcare field. Um, and yeah, currently I'm working, I'm working here in New York to uh, help with the COVID crisis that's going on. So... Um you are on the front lines as a certified nursing assistant. Correct. And so you started that uh, here in Illinois. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, there first? Yeah, so I was in high school when I, I was uh, taking the course to get certified. I, uh, my high school in Illinois was able to have like this dual enrollment program. So I was able to get certified while I was in high school uh, during my senior year. Um, so right straight out of high school, I was able to jump right into the workforce. Um, I started working in a nursing home, then I went on to work in a hospital setting, 
Um, and after that, I just started to do like travel nursing and stuff. Um, so do you want to know any like specific details about my job or? Were you working with COVID patients uh, before you came to New York? Um, so no, I wasn't because the facility I was working at in uh, DeKalb, uh, only staff had tested positive at the time. So nobody there was confirmed for COVID yet. Okay. And how did you end up in New York? So after that, um, I pretty much, I had already known about this one agency that I was interested in working in during the summer. Um, this was pre-COVID. Um, but then now COVID came along and I was uh, even more interested because I knew they, they really urgently needed uh, to place people in different locations. So when I was checking out the jobs, I saw that they were posted as crisis response. Um, so, you know, that just means they, they, they're in an urgent need um, in certain places. So I applied and I said, this is a good time to, uh, you know, uh, make that interest come to life. Um, since I always wanted to do travel nursing just to see what it's like, just to see what like the healthcare system is like in a different place in the U.S. Um, so I thought this was a perfect opportunity to do that and I can also help out. Um, so I applied and uh, yeah, we did places out here in New York. Um, so the, the place that hired us, it's like, uh, it was the Office of Emergency um, emergency Management, I believe it's called, in New York. Um, so they were just hiring like a bunch of CNAs and they are placing them at different nursing homes because uh, New York's being hit hard with uh, COVID in the nursing homes here. So are you at a particular workplace there in New York? Yeah, so they placed me at uh, one facility here, like a rehab facility. Um, yeah. And describe your role a little bit how how has it been working with patients there uh it's been good uh it hasn't been much uh, since i was doing this similar work in uh illinois it, uh, it hasn't been too different i believe um it is just uh what does put the strain on the people is all the precautions we take like uh donning the ppe correctly all the time um and we do have to get tested once a week for covid luckily it was twice a week before i got here um, but as soon as I got here, they had uh, kind of eased on that. So now it's only once a week. Um, so there's a protocol like that, it's like that kind of just takes more time um, during the day. Uh, you know, like I said, donning the PPE, making sure we're keeping uh, patients isolated, uh, you know, uh, distancing and stuff. So it does take, it's more of a workload than it, it would be on a normal, any other pre-COVID day. Um, but there is now that there's a lot of travelers that have come in the facility there's many other travelers too that are there so uh we've been able to manage the workload uh, i heard that it was a lot they had a lot less help before we got there um but now it's it's manageable and are there uh patients with uh covid at the facility that you're working at yeah and um it's interesting because you know, the the peak of the uh, virus out here has kind of gone down. We're kind of past that. Um, but I did hear that during my orientation, she said that during the peak, there was 200 uh, residents there that had positive. Um, now we're, last I heard, we were down to three. So it's really gone down. And I think really the, the reasoning for that was because the governor out here um, had mandated that nursing homes and rehab, you know, centers like this, have to take in COVID patients from hospitals. So that's really what drove up the, the uh, numbers in the nursing homes. It wasn't, it wasn't so much that uh, they were being negligent or we weren't, you know, they weren't doing their jobs. They weren't doing the PPE. Um, it was mostly just because, uh, yeah, the, they were coming from hospitals and they were having to take them in. Um, but yeah, my facility in particular, they have a, design, there's eight floors. They have a designated uh, COVID floor. So they, they're able to isolate all the COVID patients um, in one single floor. So that kind of prevents it from going on to other residents there. Do you feel safe working there? Yeah, I do. I, I don't feel, um, at first, when I first was thinking about doing this job, I was kind of scared. <laughs> and the person I'm coming with, I came with my one of my coworkers, she was also kind of scared, but um, it really wasn't what we imagined. It's not as crazy as you might've thought. Um, and, and, you know, we always feel safe. We have the right PPE they're giving us. Um, they're giving us our N95 masks. And as long as, you know, we know as long as we take precautions, there really isn't anything to fear. 
So tell us about being in New York during the crisis. Yeah. So how's it, how's it been for you? Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been our, it's been a good experience. Um, even if everything's been kind of shut, shut down. Well, when I first got here, I believe we were, they were still in phase one of uh, reopening. Now they're, I think they just started like phase three, even though they're easing back on, they were going to allow indoor dining, but now they're not. So now it's just a bunch of outdoor dining, but there is still things to do. I mean, there's, I'm near Central Park. So I like to visit Central Park. I like to go on a run near the river. Um, and it's, it's just a different atmosphere than the little town I live in back in Illinois. So I'm enjoying it. Uh, yeah. And I'm, and I, I am just working a lot too. So I'm not bored all the time. What are your hours like? So I work a uh, minimum 40 hours a week. So I'm working uh, 3 to 11 p.m. Um, and then uh, I'm also looking to probably work overtime. So I'm, I'm probably going to add an, another eight hour night shift um, between there. Do you know how long you're going to be there? And are you able to go back and forth from to DeKalb and back? Or are you just going to be in New York? Um, so I'm, my contract right now is until mid-August. Uh, so it's, it's an eight-week contract. And no, we're just, we're staying out here the whole time, uh, given the fact that I work five days a week. Traveling back and forth wouldn't be feasible. So have you had any interactions with COVID-19 patients yet? Uh, yeah, I, I have. Um, and and I, haven't, I haven't worked directly in the confirmed uh, floor yet, but I have, uh, I have passed by that floor. And um, there hasn't, like I said, there, ha there isn't too many of them. There's only three there. So I, I believe the, they're trying to keep like the staff that works there isolated in that floor um, until, say, unless once there's another peak, if there's another peak, um, hopefully not. But if there is, um, and if the governor makes them take more hospital patients in, <clears throat> I, do, I do know that we will be working uh, with uh, COVID patients directly, and mo most likely in uh, more floors than just one. Um, but as of now, uh, most of my, in my daily uh, work, I, I, I'm, a, I'm assigned to non-COVID patients right now. And how do they feel about the whole situation? Are they frightened or are there other, are there circumstances that wouldn't be in this type of facility, but are because of the crisis? Uh, so like, uh, are you asking like about the facility like how they feel? Just the patients. You know, the other oh, patients that don't have COVID that you're working with, but yeah. they're in the middle of this whole mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think everyone's kind of past the panicking part. I think a lot of them are anxious to socialize more. Um, you know, you, you might tell them, oh, you have to stay, keep your distance and whatnot, or you have to, or for example, we take precautions, like if someone has a cough, um, or some kind of sign of any kind of illness, we might say, oh, you got to eat in your room today. Um, sometimes, you know, they're allowed to eat out in the out their rooms in the dining areas as long as they're separated. Um, but say they have like a cough or something, we tell them, oh, well, you have to stay in just for precautions. Doesn't mean, you know, you have the virus or anything. Um, they might get upset. They'll be like, oh, well, I feel like I've been inside for, you know, God knows how long they've been having to quarantine. So they do, they do. I, I know they, they, is that like everyone, it's kind of, just tiring to be, um, you know, in that situation. Uh, but yeah, they, other than that, I think, I think, um, yeah, I don't think there's much fear. It's more just like, um, the, the different, the change in the atmosphere, their daily life has changed for a lot of them. So I think it's just that kind of stress and the reaction to, to the changes. How about their, uh, being away from their family, not being able to, to be visited and stuff like that? Oh yeah, that's another one. So that's that's like for a good example of the protocol that's changed. Um, and uh, like I know back home when I was working, there was uh, some regular people that I I knew really good, and I knew before COVID, their like wives would visit or stuff like that, daughters. And I think they play a very important role in their you know well being. Um, so I know it takes a toll on them, and a lot of them do express it to me. Um, they'd be like, "Oh, when are we going to see them?" You know, and and it, it, it's sad, and I know I know it's really hard on them. Um, so yeah, a lot of them. It's hard. It's hard on a lot of them just because not only you know when they're in places like this, 
yes, we become their family, we become their close, uh, you know, friends or whatever, but it's, you can't replace the, the actual family they have. And they, they, they FaceTime and, or, you know, video call or whatever, but it's, it's not the same. What is the composition of the, the patient load there um, in terms of, do you have uh, Latinx patients or basically what's the composition? Yeah, the facility in particular where I'm at is, it's a lot, even amongst the staff, I was surprised there's so much diversity. And it seems, um, it seems a lot of them are, uh, have immigrated here and they all, most of them speak more than one language for sure. They speak two or three languages and it, it surprises me. Um, a lot of the residents and the, the patients that go through there are, um, yeah, they are, they're diverse as well. So it's a lot, it is Latinx, it is, uh, you know, from all different Latino, not just, you know, like Mexico or anything. It's like all over the place, uh, Colombian, Puerto Rican. Um, there is there is a good majority of blacks there too. Um, and also a pretty large amount of Filipino uh, people there. And how has the fact that, that you are Latinx affected your relationship with your patients? Yeah, I think it's helped me uh, connect with a lot of them very well. Um, and that's, I feel like that's always like a common theme where, where I, I'm able to work, um, having that extra language connection with some of the residents and it, it's like, it clicks. You know, some, sometimes I know, I can tell like a lot of the times they try, they get frustrated that maybe there's no one that speaks their language and they can't uh, communicate exactly what they want. Um, and if they, they feel like they're getting pushed to the side because nobody can really communicate with them all the time. Um, but yeah, like as soon as I get there, there's certain people that already, they see me, they're like, oh, hola, ven pa'ca. And they kind of, you know, catch me up on what's been going on all day and what they want to do the rest of the day. And it's like, you know, it's like they, I know, I know it's really, it's really good that I, I, I think it's, it's a really good advantage, um, that I'm able to, you know, help out those people that, um, can maybe not normally communicate. How do you feel about your interactions with management and your coworkers? Yeah, so uh, I, I like it. Everyone's been uh, good. So I feel like everybody enjoys their job there, um, even though things may have been more stressful. I think they do appreciate that we're there to help. Um, the management in particular has been really good too. They, they've, been, uh, like they've been flexible about like our schedule if we want to do anything. Um, and they, yeah, they've, they're, always, they're always there for if we need anything. If we need help, they always encourage us to talk to them. Um, and yeah, and the coworkers, they, they also appreciate that we're there to help. How has your experience uh, as a healthcare worker in this crisis affected your other relationships back home or, or even there in New York? Mm -hmm. um, so back, back at home, for sure, it was, it's been different since the crisis uh, hit because so my grandparents lived with me. Uh, in my, my house with my parents and my rest of my siblings and all of them. My grandparents live there, so I, especially during the early time, I, I uh, did not go to my house at all. So I would stay over with my girlfriend. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I, were, I mean, I was still working in the Kelvin stuff. So I, I in particular was uh, scared to go visit because I knew I worked directly with people that, you know, are in a high risk. Uh, so I didn't want to put that risk on my uh, grandma and my grandpa. Um, so I didn't visit at home much. So that kind of made me already, even though I was in the same town as my family, made me kind of feel isolated from them. Um, and I'm usually really close to my family. So, so it was, it's, it was, you know, it was, it was kind of uh, sad, but at the same time, it's like, I know I'm doing it for, I don't want, cause I don't want to, you know, put my family in risk. Um, so I was doing that for a good reason. Um, but I still, like I said, I still called them and I, I, it's not like I lost connection with my family or anything. Um, so that was, I think that was in particular the only really, uh, major, uh, change with my relationships. Other than that, my other friends, I still was able to socialize through social medias and stuff. So that wasn't too much of an issue. Yeah. I was thinking about disaster relief and frontline heroes, which of which you are certainly one, um, somebody that comes back from a hurricane relief or a forest fire or something like that, uh, they don't, they don't have this additional thing of, you know, a contagious disease and you come back from that and you, you have these concerns. 
you know, what goes through your mind, you know, with your girlfriend or with your family or whatever, uh, doing the work that you're doing and then, you know, trying to integrate back into your normal life? Um, like what goes through my mind? Yeah. I'm. Mm-hmm. How concerned are you about, you know, the fact mm-hmm. that you're, that you're in a particular situation that could possibly present a problem for them? Yeah. Um, so I think, it, um, it's, I guess it's like, you know, I know, I know I have to, for, especially with my family and my grandparents, I, I know I have to, it's best for them, for me to isolate as much as I can, not visit them. Um, so it's not like, I don't think it's straining relationships per se, like, like necessarily like, oh, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, my relationship is going to change forever. Cause I think everybody knows, um, and they respect at least, I, I don't know if there's other people that are in different situations that their friends or family don't respect the I, the idea that they want to isolate to keep them safe. Um, but, you know, my, my friends and people I'm around, they, if I were to say, hey, I can't see you for X amount of time, because that was um, how it was the case. I was telling people, yeah, I can't hang out. Um, my brother, I had to be like, no, I can't go over because, <laughs> you know, he lives with my grandparents too, even though if, it was, if he lives on a different floor in the house, but if he said, come over, um, I would just be like, no, because, you know, I, I want, I want you to respect that. I want to keep my family safe. So I don't think it strained my relationships and I wasn't ever really worried about that. Um, so I, I think I'm blessed in that way that my friends and family, um, they understand the situation I'm in and they understand the decisions I have to make and they respect my choices for it. Have they had any, uh, repercussions or problems with, with COVID-19, either your family or other people that you know? Yeah, so, well, I did, well, my family, really, we weren't affected, like, from the fact that uh, they lost jobs or anything, so I'm really lucky my family um, didn't lose their jobs, they're still working um, in their, you know, essential jobs. Um, one, one aunt, her uh, husband, well, uh, yeah, so my uncle, he, um, he did get he did get a uh, COVID and he did end up in the hospital, um, but this is like family that I don't see too often. But my my dad told me about that, um, so my dad was kind of worried there for a bit um, because his uh, so yeah so his he was worried about his sister, but um, she was she ended up being okay. She was just taking care of him while he was in the hospital. Um, so he he got he got kind of hit with the most severe symptoms. Um, but yeah, um, other than that, my family didn't lose their jobs really. Um, yeah, no, none of my, my siblings didn't lose their jobs. So we, we were able to stay afloat. We didn't have to go through that worry that I know a lot of families uh, were going through having to go like on unemployment or just unemployed in general. Um, yeah. Have they changed their routines and their daily life during this period? Yeah, let me see. So I know it's, it, this, this has been going on for so long. It's like, uh, you know, they, it, we, we, when we, like when it started, things have been a little different since like when it first started to uh, now. Cause yeah, when it first started, um, yeah, I know my, my mom really wasn't going out as much. No one was going out um, unless they needed to for like groceries. And, and I would even tell them like, Hey, you need groceries. Um, you know, I'm going to the store. You tell me I can go and I can drop it off for you or something um, to try to like minimize our time out. So we really took it serious in the beginning. And I feel like, like everyone wants it, you know, now, like jump forward to now, um, people are kind of easing back on the fear, I guess, the fear side. So people are, are not as, as uh, scared to go out, I, I guess. Um, so now, now they, my mom does go to like the groceries more. Um, and they, I know they have been like for Father's Day, they did uh, gather up at my uncle's house and stuff, um, which I know I try to, I recommend I'm like, I'm like, put a mask on my grandma or something. I'm still, I'm, I feel like I'm still very more worried than they are now. Um, and I think it just comes with like my experience in the job that I, I just, I know it's real. I know, you know, a lot of people might think, oh, um, you know, everyone freaked out and it wasn't warranted, but I know it's still real. So, so for me, I, I feel a lot more worried, I guess now than they do. Um, and I understand too. I don't, I, I don't want to, I also, I don't want to get angry at my parents, like my parents, or, you know, be like, hey, you guys are responsible for letting my grandma, like, socialize this much. Um, so I don't want to do that, because, yeah, that, that would be, I think, a problematic point if I start pointing fingers. And um, But I, I do just remind them, hey, 
try to keep her in, you know, keep keep her safe. Um, and I tell her, you know, I, I tell them what I see. I'm like, I see people their age that get sick and some of them die. And uh, so I try to just be that reminder for them. Um, but yeah, so now since from the beginning, since the beginning, they've uh, their routines have changed as in their more uh, they've eased back on restrictions themselves. It's kind of a role reversal, isn't it? I mean, you're a young man just a little while ago your parents were telling you what to do and now you're kind of in a position where yeah. you have a, an authority to, to try to keep them safe. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. It kind of feels that way. Yep. Yeah. But you know, you know, and I, it's uh, you want to like, I want to do it in a respectful way, you know, cause it's my parents and uh, I know they, they don't mean harm or anything either. <laughs> so it's, it's tricky. It is. Yeah. But, um, the fact that they feel a little more relaxed now has to do partly too with the approach that's been taken in Illinois in contrast to other places. So I wanted to ask you about how you feel about the leadership in this crisis. You're also in a place where uh, measures were taken and have changed the situation. But how, how do you feel, you know, you, you have been placed in a vulnerable situation by this crisis. How do you feel about the leadership nationally or elsewhere about this um this whole covid thing yeah um so and and particularly to illinois i am i'm very uh happy with how the governor has kind of stood his ground with his decisions um i know he's been getting a lot of backlash uh for being on the i guess one of the more strict states um and for as far as <laughs> restrictions and it's funny because i know this i uh one of one day i did travel up to wisconsin um shortly before I came here. Um, I did travel up to Wisconsin with uh, my girlfriend. We went to like, the, we wanted to visit the lake over there. Um, but it was, and we, I, I had like forgotten that uh, Wisconsin pretty much had eased all restrictions. So when I got there, I'm like, oh my God, there's so many people, the stores, the bars are open. And, and like, I started to uh, talk to somebody and like, oh yeah, you guys are from Illinois. Everything's like still in lockdown. We're like, yeah, they're like, yeah, we're here. Nothing is in lockdown. I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it was just like, wow, I, kn I knew there that like it, it really the way it, the states are handling this can vary, really vary uh, largely state by state. Um, so uh, anyway, in regards with how Illinois was taking care of the situation, um, I, I am I am happy that the numbers have been uh, low and they've been trending low in Illinois. Um, I feel like Illinois could have really become one of these epicenters like New York did or like now a lot of places in Texas are becoming or Arizona. And I think uh, I think they were expecting that of Chicago, and I just think it never even got to that point. Um, luckily, like I know they had opened uh, that uh, emergency uh, uh, temporary hospital in McCormick Place, um, and I was also looking into uh, working there too, um, if if it ever the need ever came. Um, but I know when the need never came for that place. They never actually had to use it because the the numbers never got as big as they would have imagined. And I think it all kind of has to do with the restrictions the governor put in place. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm happy that, that it never got that bad over there. Um, but now, now I know like, you know, that it's been a, a while since this first started. So a lot of states are very anxious to open back up. So, uh, I, I think it, and it is a tricky thing cause I know the economy it's taking like a, a hit and a lot of families are taking a, a toll. Um, so it's hard, it's hard for, I, I can't imagine what kind of things go through these leaders minds when they're trying to make the decision, they're kind of balancing people's welfare and then also for people's lives as well. Um, so when it comes to that, I, I do think uh, states like Illinois and states like uh, New York have been doing well. Um, mainly, I think because they do, they do, they, they know that people's welfare might be in jeopardy, but I know I was watching like the New York governor talk and he was talking about how there's the consequences of opening up too quick. It might be death and it's, it's pretty much, it's going to be death. You know, that that's the consequence. People are going to die if we open them too quick. And he's like, yes, I know. I hear your guys' concerns. I know that um, being inside, there's been more uh, domestic abuse cases, more child abuse cases. There's been terrible things going on. There's been, uh, you know, people unemployed, people maybe losing houses. He's like, that's all terrible. That's all terrible. But if we open up too quick, the consequence on that side is death. He's like, what well, can get worse than death? 
and that I mean I, I I see that I see I see how that's a good argument I I kind of agree with that argument because really what these states other states right now are doing that are becoming the hot spots like Arizona which has been kind of one of the more uh, loose on restrictions uh, they're experiencing a lot, large number of hospitalizations hard, large number of deaths um, and that's I think that's just lives in general is, is it's a very high price to pay just for wanting to open up a state too quick um so i know the i know the 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 way people, different states are handling it is is very different um so i'm i really don't know uh what states doing it the right way either um but i do want to i do say that the states are experiencing less of a resurge or in, in the number of cases i am happy that that's happening um, but at the same time, I also know that uh, the other leaders, like the federal leaders, the uh, legislators, they need to they need to find another way to uh, provide aid to people economically and the businesses, especially because I know a lot of businesses are going to have to shut down because of this, and they already have. So I know those people also need to be taken care of, though. So um, I think there's different responsibilities there because the state itself cannot um, you save all the businesses and all the people from uh, poverty, but uh, then at that point, the federal level has to step in and uh, come up with some kind of legislation that will help everybody get back on their feet. How about in terms of the federal response to COVID-19 in particular? Uh, mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that make you feel? What are your thoughts about, about that? Yeah, um, well, I, I know compared to other countries, I know the U.S. Um, has really just become the the global hotspot for the virus. Um, so I know somewhere in there they went wrong. Something went wrong at some point. Um, I think our, I think the U.S. is like response rate, um, you know, and, and, and the fact and how long it took for us to take it serious uh, was, was bad. And I think that that all has to do with um, the federal government. They kind of failed to ring the alarm early enough. Because um, for a while, I remember seeing how the virus was bad in like places like Italy um places you know in china how things were they were like i remember when i first heard italy's in full lockdown well the u.s i was in the gym i believe when i heard that i was at the gym and though so the, so you know and uh, and you think the federal government has not rang the alarm here so you think oh this is happening elsewhere it's not going to happen here um and very likely things the disease was already coming in the virus was already coming in at that point um and it probably just really took a while for the U.S. to realize how big of an issue was going to be here. And then especially with early on in the testing, how it was difficult for people to get tested in the beginning. Um, you know, the federal government also failed to um, provide, you know, prompt testing in, around the states to realize how big of a, what kind of problem we were facing at the time. Um, and I, I, I'm glad they were able to pass some kind of like uh, stimulus uh, package there. You know that supported businesses, supported individuals, um, but yeah, I know. I also know that it hasn't been enough for some people, given the fact that there's people that have to pay rent. Some people only got the twelve hundred dollar uh, stimulus uh, check, and you know that's obviously not enough to cover rent for multiple months. So I worry about those people. Um, but yeah, I and I and I, I do also worry for uh, being an immigrant. I do worry for the immigrant families that haven't been able to qualify for like the aid and stuff and they have lost jobs maybe like I said I'm, I'm uh, grateful that my family didn't lose jobs and I'm hopeful that you know immigrants uh, you know knowing the kind of jobs they take on I'm hopeful that they are still all uh, essential workers but you know I know there's also like restaurants have closed down maybe there's immigrants that work in restaurants so maybe now they're unemployed and uh, maybe they don't qualify for unemployment so I worry about those people and I think um, I think, you know, the, the legislators need to take them into consideration. Um, and I know, like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also proud of uh, Chicago's mayor, how she uh, did provide some kind of a, a stimulus plan for uh, undocumented folks. Um, so I think that's, that's very, that's something that states can also do because that's such a smaller percentage of the population that I think states can handle those people. They can come up with a way to uh, take care of them, even if the federal government isn't. So why did you decide to come become a healthcare professional? Yeah, so um, 
man, this is a good question. I need to come up with an answer for med school. <laughs> and I have thought about this. And um, so really when I was young, uh, I had interviewed or I had gone to translate at like appointments with my family. Um, so they, we you know whether my, my family was sick or whatever. And even for my mom's friends, they would say, oh, your son can come translate for me, you know, and she sent me as a translator. <laughs> so from a young age, I was translating for them at uh, doctor's appointments. And I was always, I always really respected uh, the way patients saw the, the healthcare professionals and the way the healthcare professionals cared for the patients. I, I, saw, them, I saw them as in, in a very like respectable position. Um, so my respect for healthcare workers started at such a young age um, when I was doing stuff like that. So later on, once I went into uh, high school, I, I realized how much I like science and how much I like learning about biological stuff. So I uh, immediately that kind of clicked with, um, wow, I would probably like working in healthcare. Um, so senior year of high school, I found the opportunity to become a CNA. And I thought, well, this is going to be a good way to figure out this is really what I want to do. Um, I, you know, I become a CNA. I love it. I love learning everything that we learned. I like learning about uh, the human body, uh, all that stuff. And then I start working in healthcare and it's like everything I, I like pulling back. So layers of the healthcare system and how it works and, um, working in the healthcare setting. I, I do like it. I like, um, you know, the way there's a bunch of different healthcare professionals. They all work together towards the same goal. Um, so I think it's a really good setting. Um, so I, I, I fell in love with the role of a healthcare professional. Um, and yeah, so now my experience is just kind of, drive me closer to that goal now it kind of helps me visualize what I'm going to be doing one day. And has COVID-19 affected how you feel about your career choice at all? You know, kind of in a way, um, and I'm not in a negative way. And, uh, I would say in a very like, uh, you know, I don't know. It makes me excited. It makes me excited that, um, during times like this, I can be someone that can, uh, respond to like the call for action um you know like if they say oh we need help you know there's something going on here you you know please bring your skills here um i you know i feel excited that that's i'm going to be able to do that one day and i have like i follow uh doctors on like social medias and stuff and i know doctors that are also doing the same thing they they had there's been doctors that have had to come to new york too and they share their experiences and i think it's just it's a very uh it's a good, I think it's a good role. It's a good uh, feeling to be in that role in that position to be able to offer your skills to help uh, literally, you know, humanity save lives. Um, so I'm excited for that. I'm excited to one day uh, be a part of that. I, I mean, like I already am, but I just, I want to, you know, build on those skills um, so I can do that, you know, to a greater extent, I guess, at some point. How do you see yourself in the future? So I see, yeah, I see... I see what well, there's ever any other kind of pandemic or any other kind of situation crisis situation that uh, requires, you know, me to like relocate for a while or something. I think because of my experiences today, I think I'll be definitely more uh, open to it. Definitely more uh, willing to help. Um, Cause I think, I think like my experience now having just relocating and stuff um, and seeing how, you know, the facilities and stuff there, everyone's grateful to have extra help. Um, I think that's just that's gonna make me more willing to help for sure in, in any future disasters that occur. So you're gonna be a doctor? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> and um, that then that you know I'm I'm also I'm still learning about different roles in medicine, so um, I'm for sure open to um, choosing a different career. I I do know I want to uh, become get an advanced degree in uh, healthcare, um, but in particular to which field, like which role. Um, there might be leeway still, but I'm, I'm just finding out more about them. Are you still a student right now or are you taking a break while you're, while you're doing this work? Yeah. So, um, that's a good question. I, so I did, uh, I was just, uh, I just finished a semester, uh, in the spring for, uh, that was technically the end of my sophomore year. Um, now as far as my junior year, it, it probably will look a little different. Because for one, I know that a lot of classes are uh, completely online, and I, I personally didn't like online class at all. Um, so I am already, uh, right now I am registered for uh, an anatomy class 
and uh, that's a hybrid class because there's labs, so I know they're doing lab in person, but everything else is going to be online. So I'm still really thinking about it. I'm still really thinking of uh, whether that's what I want to do. I already decided that I'm not going to do full time uh, classes in the fall, um, but I'm still I'm still really thinking about this. Um, if I'm going to do the anatomy class or not. Uh, so my my junior year is definitely going to look different. And my and I wouldn't I don't like to say it's going to push me back with my you know endeavors with my journey, but it, it's just going to be something different. Because for me, I'm already I'm already doing something I like. I, I'm already working in healthcare. I'm not anxious to go anywhere else. Um, so I'm just, I'm going with my journey. And for me, this is part of my journey. Being out here is part of my healthcare journey. This is going to be an experience that's helping me realize that this is what I want to do. Um, so I'm not, I'm not um, particularly anxious or, uh, you know, or upset. Oh, maybe I can do, maybe I won't graduate when I plan to or whatever. Um, that just kind of, I'm, I'm just kind of uh, figuring it out as I go, I think. Can you tell me a little bit more about your feelings about, education now the online aspect and and how you feel about that some some people really you know like it and, and others have problems with it yeah so like i mentioned that, uh, me in particular i i don't i don't i'm not a fan of it um but i just think that has to do with uh you know it, it has to do with people i know there's people that are very neat and very uh like self-disciplined you know they they can write their schedules out and they'll follow them I've never, I've never for one been a person that has like, you know, wrote a schedule down and be like, Hey, I'm going to do this at this time. I've never been that person. I'm always more of a person that just kind of knows like, Oh, I have this bullet to cross off and this is what I have to accomplish at some point, some way I'm going to figure out how to accomplish it. Um, so I'm not sure if that's like an advantage or disadvantage in the long run, but I know that for like online stuff, it doesn't work very well for me. I actually had to surprise myself when our classes were half my semester, you know, just one day was switched to online and I was like in this position, like, wow, I, I, I feel like there's more pressure on me to figure out uh, what assignments I have to do, what lectures I have to do, when and where. And so I had to uh, whip out my actual, uh, uh, what's it called? Like the dry erase board out with the, with the calendar and I had to actually write stuff and I had to actually pull up my Google calendar and write assignments and due dates. And I had to plan myself, when am I going to watch these lectures? When am I going to, you know, and it was it was hard to figure out at first, and I did kind of get into a rhythm at some point, but it's it's not for me. That's not the ideal way to learn, uh, especially the fact that exams are like uh, like you know uh, at home online, and for those uh, they're most of the time the teacher just say open oh, though because at the end of the day they can't really check if you're using notes or not. Uh, so for me that that I know it's bad, but for me that makes that kind of drives my motivation to study less. It's like oh well. Do I really have to spend this much time memorizing this if I'm going to have my notes here? Um, and I think I think you just naturally fall into that that uh, routine, and you feel like you don't absorb the material as much. Uh, I feel like I'm more of a person that works good under pressure. So if I'm if I'm thinking I have an exam tomorrow, I'm not going to have notes. I will kind of motivate myself to uh, absorb the information more. So for me, I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> so I, I'm hopeful that you know, like I said, I'm not sad that I have to take a semester or a year off if I have to. Um, but you know, um, once things can go a little more to normal, then I'm happy to jump right back in. This is a, a time of a resurgence of a contagious disease, but also resurgence of social movements. Mm -hmm. And I think you've, you've been involved as an activist before. How has this new, uh, period affected that your, your role as an activist? Yeah, um, so I, I think there is, um, yeah, the, the political climate right now, I think it's tense. Um, and I, I think that just, it just, I, I, don't, I don't know if it has to do with the crisis, but, and I know, I mean, it has more to do with like recent events um, and a buildup of frustration. Um, and it just, it's kind of, it's weird that it lined up with the year that this is, this crisis stuff is going on. Um, so there, like when, uh, like attending protests, for example, there's that like, oh, I have to go. And I have to feel like, oh my God, we're, we're doing something wrong in a way because we're not supposed to be you know, socializing and stuff. But I also do know that the protests are something that can't wait. This is like reform that has to happen now. Um, we can't, you know, we can't just, I mean, we've seen that police aren't just shutting down their abuse because of the crisis. So we, I feel like there's that, um, for me, there's that 
moral like obligation to take action even even now um because yeah I, i've always been uh i've definitely been like advocating for uh immigrants and my communities and so i know it's just as important to be advocating for other communities that kind of experience similar uh discrimination and stuff um so for me that and then especially because of the tension that's been going on for me this is especially a year that i think i need to be more vocal about uh stuff and I definitely need to be more willing to participate. Um, and I think, you know, we don't need to let, uh, we don't need to let, you know, the, the crisis situation uh, kind of stop us from doing that change, um, especially because this is, once, once we got momentum going, we got to keep it there, you know? Um, there's been a lot of attention with like the protests and stuff going on recently. So I think, I think that's, that's good for the movements and we got to keep that momentum going. Um, yeah. You were, you were involved in dream action uh, before, is that, is that correct? Do you, yeah. do you feel like uh, that some of that work prepared you for this particular historical moment where things are really risen to a crescendo? Yeah, I think so, for sure. Because um, like I attended my first protest with Dream Action. Um, so I kind of know, uh, you know, protest etiquette, um, you know, kind of like what, not, what to avoid and what, what kind of things to do. Um, so that did definitely prepare me uh, for this. And it also, it also, I mean, yeah, Dream Action has been a very, it's been a great thing to be a part of, if, especially if you want to be involved in, a, a, like, activism. So, because there with activism, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things you kind of need to learn, especially, like, it's good to learn about past uh, movements, um, you know, to see what kind of, what kind of uh, things do we kind of have to mirror in our current efforts and what kind of things can we build on. Um, so, so Dream Action has definitely been like a big, uh, it's kind of helped me develop as an activist for sure. And there's been a lot of great role models that I've met at Dream Action that um, for sure I'd, I'd look up to. And um, so, so yeah, and, I, and I've also met, I've seen the importance too of being an ally. Um, I know, and, and even now, like I get, um, I've had family members <laughs> and it's crazy that they say this, but they're like, why are you out there? You're not black or something, you know? And it's like, well, it's it's important that I'm out here. This is a this is a minority group. This is a, a group that's being oppressed. Um, I know we're not the movements that I've been involved in recently have not been focused on uh, um, people of my background, particularly. But it's uh, similar issues, and I tell them that you know, like it's it's important because I've seen it. I've seen other people advocate for me, and I and um, you know it helps when other people you have allies there. So I see I've seen the importance of uh, being an ally for sure. So that's why I. Uh, I really, I really do try to make myself an ally for, you know, any group that's oppressed. Mm -hmm. And this, this new activism that's, that's come about on issues that aren't necessarily related to COVID-19 have uh, engendered some divisions within the society itself. I, I wonder if you see any of that reflected in your workplace there in New York, where you have a very diverse population. Is there... Does anybody express blame or, you know, divisions based on, on where they're coming from? Um, yeah, well, I think out here, out here in New York, I haven't seen, I haven't been here too long, so I haven't seen really much of, of that kind of talk about anything really that's going on politically. Um, I know back at home, I did see more of that um, in the workplace, um, especially like among staff workers, um, a lot of them have different, very different opinions that are on different ends of the spectrum. Um, there's always those that try to vilify like what's going on, the people that are involved in it, you know, they try to say, oh, they're being irresponsible, they're, you know, that's that's not the way to do things. Um, and I have even amongst the, the residents back at home, I also have, I've seen people on both ends of the spectrum as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it, I don't know, it's hard to have those conversations and, and um, you know, so especially in the workplace, it's always like a touchy, it's always a touchy uh, subject. It's like a, it's something you try, I guess you try to avoid in the workplace, you know, try to keep it professional, especially if it's with like a patient, you know, you don't want to, and if they're disagreeing with you. But I think, I think my experience is like uh, being a minority in uh, medicine in the healthcare field. I think that's kind of prepared me for like those kind of conversations or if that ever comes up because I have uh, many occasions I've had like people discriminate against me. Oh, I don't like Mexicans take care of me. Or even guys, you know, oh, I don't like guys taking care of me. And I don't, I don't, uh, I don't mind, you know, I don't mind that kind of stuff. I know, I, I feel like I've learned how to deal with it. Um, 
and there's always a place and time for those kind of conversations too i think so um you know it's it, it's a good it's always good to uh give give your stance on things um you know never be argumentative um and also how to de-escalate i guess those are all things that i've uh, learned is important to especially being in the healthcare field you never you never want to make somebody feel like you're going to discriminate against them because they think differently than you um so you kind of try to mask all those beliefs there but you know if it ever does come up you i, I think i've learned kind of how to deal with that how do you deal with that like when yeah, you get well, that when you get that pushback from patients yeah um well i mean i always i always like i said i always try to de-escalate so i always uh, you know i ask them oh why you know why do you feel that way um, and, you know, they might explain. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll say my stance, you know, I'll say, oh, okay, well, you know, this is what I think. And whenever, whenever they say after that, you know, no matter how offensive it is, I might just say, okay, you know, okay. Um, and, if, and if there's really ever someone that's like blatantly upset with how I feel or I, if I just think that it's best for me not to take care of them, I can always be like, you want me to get somebody else to take care of you? Um, you know, I've had to do that too. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I, I definitely do not try to be argumentative in the, the workplace. It's not the place for that, um, especially because us as healthcare workers, we are supposed to be uh, seeing everybody as equal, for sure. We are never supposed to discriminate. Uh, even if I have a racist come in, someone that's blatantly racist, um, I'm not, I can't, uh, I can't, uh, you know, in many essences, we have to step back. We have to uh, kind of take our emotions out for a minute. Um, and you learn how to do that, you know, because you, we see people die sometimes, you know, we see uh, things that might be uh, harsh on more people that might take more emotional toll on normal people. So we kind of learn how to just take a step back. Um, so when I'm at work, I know I know how to do that. Um, so I do not I don't get upset. You know, it doesn't upset me. And I think that's a good thing to always keep your composure um, because we are in a you know, I've always learned this is a very respected role. So we have to be that that person that people can respect. Presumably, a lot of the people that you work with uh, as patients are older. Uh, I'm just curious if anyone has expressed anything about the fact that they might see on TV, you know, young people going out to bars, going to the beach or whatever, and not really thinking about who ultimately might die or get sick from their behavior. Has has any is there any feeling about that on the part of the, the older people that you work with that that's that's kind of a difficult thing to see when you're potentially the victim of that yeah um yeah i i guess um i have seen like directly or maybe a little more indirectly um the the fear like they like they have said to me like oh they it seems like they, they let anybody come in this place you know because uh, especially like where, ha where I have been working even here and back at home, it's, you know, big facilities. And so a lot of the times we, we see different people that we work with, different people that we haven't seen before. And when they see a new face, I think it, I think because of what they've been seeing on the news and stuff, they, they get, they get scared. They're like, Oh, you're a new face. Oh, um, you know, they say, they see everyone out there is, is doing, you know, they, I guess, I think they look at me as a new face and they picture I've been out there doing, you know, socializing and whatnot. And, potentially exposing myself more than I should. And they they kind of get uh, uneasy about that. I have heard people get uneasy about that. Like, oh, wow, they let anybody just come in this place, you know? And I know it's not like that. They don't let visitors and stuff nowadays. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, they, they have said stuff like that. And I think that all kind of has to do with, um, uh, you know, the, the way things are around that people aren't taking precautions. And they kind of see like, and it, it's, it's weird because I, I, and I see it this way too, I mean, the people that are in these places uh, for long term, they're not going to contract the virus unless we contract the virus. So I see their fear. You know, they're in there, so they're. I mean, you know, in theory, they they won't get sick unless one of us takes it in. So I, I see their fear when they do see a new face. It's like, wow, you know, you're um, potentially the one to bring it in, and I know it's scary for them because, like you said, they're a high risk uh, population, and so. You know, I also feel that responsibility myself, like when I take, you know, in my daily living, I, I see that responsibility as I, I really don't want to get sick either because that could be, you know, catastrophic in my workplace. Do you ever have a conversation with them about that, about how conscientious you are in the outside world 
to make sure that they're safe? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, I know back at home there was, uh, there, you know, actually someone does come to mind. There's a, a younger lady that's that's there. I mean, younger than the average age at the place. Um, but she would talk to me about, you know, about what's going on. She watches the news and stuff. And I would tell her, yeah, I'm like, well, and, you know, you don't want to, I know you don't want to freak them out, but you also don't want to provide false hope or anything. But I'm like, yeah, I mean, we, as long as we all take precautions, I tell her that I wear my mask. And then I, she also like asked me, so should I wear my mask here? And I'm like, yeah, you know, wear your mask here. I mean, that's what we take precautions for. We don't, I'm not wearing a mask because I'm sick. I'm wearing a mask because I'm taking precautions. So I tell her, you know, like the, the way we can prevent this, you know, what, what they're telling us is, you know, wear a mask and wash your hands. Uh, keep your distance from people and i think uh just reassuring them you know that if we if we kind of if we're all taking preventative measures reassuring them that we all do our part um uh we can prevent you know something like from reaching the catastrophic level and i think that provides some kind of relief to them so is there anything else that you'd like to share with me about your experiences with covid19 that i haven't asked you about already um let's see No, um, no, not necessarily. Um, no, I think I, I think we talked about a lot of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really want to thank you, Jose, for sharing your stories with us and, and future scholars and others to help them understand what it was like experiencing this moment in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. It, you know, it feels good to talk about what, you know, the situation. <laughs>